So we're going to uh, change pace just a little bit and uh, discuss the topic of stakeholder engagement. And, and I think this comes back to the, to the fact that uh, the, the vision uh, uh, of smart one water is compelling, but it's also exceedingly complex and uh, uh, in, in terms of both systems and challenges and, and uh, the people that are involved. And so uh, we're going to spend the next few uh, few minutes uh, investigating this this concept of stakeholder engagement. And there there are a few questions that I would pass out at the at the very beginning, and suggest that these are questions that uh, we need to think about through not only this engagement as we, but as we move on. Um, and the first one is who exactly are the stakeholders, and um, and then of those stakeholders who need to be at the table to provide. Um, input. And for those that are not at the table, how do we address those needs and concerns? And, and I think we're particularly uh, uh, aware of the fact that they're marginalized communities that uh, tend to not get their needs and concerns addressed. And finally, how do we communicate uh, with and, and keep these stakeholders engaged uh, throughout the process so that we actually can achieve this this mission of, of creating a, a community of practice around this area of smart one water. Um, so we're gonna get five uh, viewpoints on this over the next few minutes. And we're gonna start with Fred Pfeiffer from the Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission. Fred, are you, uh, you on? There you yeah. are. So let me see if I can get to this. So I'll try to, uh, you, do you see that? Yes, we can. Okay. So anyway, the, uh, we've been doing these, I guess, uh, what, 10 years, uh, as I recall. And uh, so, and it's actually come a long way since the uh, beginning and somehow I zipped through my presentation. So here we go. And so, I mean, we, uh, we began the thing with, uh, I think, First one I went to might have been 2000, 2001. I mean, we were pretty much working on, uh, you know, very actually old technology. I mean, there were computers and so forth, but the amount of the advances in the technology for water management, for leak detection and so forth were very similar to what you had seen in uh, maybe from the 50s and 60s. So for uh, WSSC, it's a fairly old uh, utility. It's, it, it surrounds uh, Washington, D.C., as you can see. And uh, parts of it are, you know, date back to uh, prior to World War II. So we have a pretty broad, uh, you know, assembly of uh, assets. And, you know, when, when you grow up around, when it came up through or after World War II, uh, a lot of these areas grew, yeah, and I remember them, unfortunately, uh, the, uh, they were, it was fairly remote as you got, you know, once you were outside of DC, it's now fairly urban. So in, uh, you know, in, you we're looking at things that were built in the fifties and through seventies, and uh, they're 70 years old already. and. In, in our next Nessie curve, we're going to be going up to 2050. That's 30 years from now. It's not really as long as it seems. And uh, a lot of the growth was out in relatively unpopulated areas uh, coming off the post-war period. And uh, it, now they're very urban. So, and at the same time, they're you know, it's it's hard to maintain or make or do new construction in those areas and maintain some level of service to the uh, stakeholders. So, whoops, jeez, uh, I'm jumping ahead. So the I'm what I've been looking at is the need to we have uh, I have the water network that I'm responsible for, and that's two water plants and a series of tanks and pumping stations, but it, it's a pushing uh, 6,000 miles of pipe. And uh, some of that dates back to the 30s, some of it even earlier. And uh, so, and much of that's cast iron. 
And uh, the uh, so by 2055, I mean, we're looking at 2050, 2055, there's 1600 miles of pipe just of that era that will have to replace. And then you throw on top of that, you have treatment plants that were built in the 60s and 70s. They're 50 years old. The technologies are uh, pretty much antiquated. We had uh, PLCs that are were made by furnace, if anybody remembers those. I mean, they were still around in 2015. I mean, this is, I mean, it, many of these uh, technologies are now antiquated. They worked as well as they worked until you can't get parts for them anymore. So uh, it's not, it's a funding issue, but there's also logistics that uh, aren't actually getting any easier. So my theme, I guess, is mainly time may be running out to, I mean, we're accumulating a backlog of projects that we'd uh, like to do, but the backlog continues to build. And uh, so there's only so much backlog you can tolerate before uh, it becomes overwhelming. So if we don't start getting ahead of the uh, demand, the you know so-called echoes that uh, you hear described uh, from when you built it back in the 50s and 60s, that stuff's really getting old. It wasn't really great stuff to begin with. And it's simply going to become over, you know, it could become overwhelming if you don't begin chipping at it now. So, you know, up till I'd say probably 2010, you could kind of defer things. I mean, they weren't good, but maybe they weren't urgent. But uh, as time goes on, and many of the technologies they talked about today could help that. But uh, in terms of weeding out which ones to get to, uh, you know, it's it, it's going to eventually lead to disruptions in service. And you know, as hard as utilities work to maintain a level of service and do all these things, I mean, there's only so much uh, you can you know you can do. So we may become victims of our own efforts. And uh, the the other issue is. There are various strategies, and uh, but there's a really, it seems to me, a lack of a consistent theme. Everybody's pursuing technology, which is great, and uh, but there's like it would be hard to identify a common theme in in the industry as a whole. I, I was surprised to hear that only 40% of utilities are doing asset management. I mean, how's that even? You know, it's, I don't see how that's even possible. Uh, you know, in reality. So, you know, it's it, there hasn't been, you know, we've heard infrastructure, but it's usually focused on roads, bridges, and so forth. I rarely hear about water, sewer, or any of the water, you know, these utilities. So, uh, what would we do if uh, all of a sudden you developed, you know, funding became available? I mean, they were talking about that maybe a year or two ago. I'm not sure I mean, we're ready to have an abundance of money. You'd have things that would, you know, you really have to consider in terms of logistics. You have a major, I mean, you even have competition now for material and labor with surrounding utilities. We're surrounded, we got DC water close, we've got Howard County close, we got Loudon, we got Fairfax and so forth. I mean, it's, everybody's going for the same pool of, uh, contractors, you know, manufacturers, and so forth. So, I mean, I, I think as a, we've got some of the best uh, minds in the business in this meeting, what would we do if, I mean, what's the common industry uh, standard? I mean, how long would it take to renovate all this stuff? And uh, what, who should go first? I mean, the oldest utilities, the most densely popular, how would you, how would you manage the day-to-day -day implementation of uh, replacement if you, if money wasn't even a factor? And then ultimately, who would administer it? So anyway, I just want to open up the floor to uh, discussion. 
because we do have some of the best people in the business in, you know, right here attending the conference. Any questions? And we do have a couple minutes for questions. If you could uh, indicate so in the chat. And uh, if, if you don't get to it right away, we can certainly uh, discuss it at, uh, at a later point. Um, if you, if you well, check the box. Is it just I, me? I have a question. Or do, do others uh, share that view? I mean, I'm not even sure. It's no, you know, I'm not sure I'm right. And, uh, you know, but uh, it's just, it's, the industries that I think has been slow to adopt some, you know, there's an institutional resistance to new technology. There's obviously a funding limitation. So, you know, but this stuff, I think we can, it could last a long time, but it, we know it won't last forever. So, you know, when do we need to do this? Uh, Pierre, did you have a comment? Yeah, sure, uh, Fred. So thank you for um, you know sharing your uh, your your perspective, and it's uh, it's a really important one. I guess my my question is, you know, to what extent has there been like some type of um, kind of consistent effort to think about, um, you know, think about you know prioritizations. Um, do scenario planning, you know, risk analysis, consequence analysis, whatever you call it, right. um, you know, consistently, right? And, uh, and bring that into consideration. I mean, I can see how there's, you know, there could be all kinds of, um, you know, various types of motivations that could come in that actually, you know, we were uh, guide what happens, but having kind of like some kind of consistency in, in principles and uh, and strategy uh, might be helpful. Yes, uh, we're uh, we were in a, I was in a meeting earlier this morning. We're trying to do a balance tool, so to speak, where you you know because a lot of pipe in, in the network really isn't high consequence. I mean, it's, you know, on a residential street, it's got so many people on it and that's kind of it. And, uh, but uh, so some of these things, even though they're valuable, they're not a panacea. And uh, so we're trying to optimize how we pick them, try to separate the ones that are very close, but not entirely the same. And, uh, you know, it's a difficult problem. I mean, you know, transmission mains, the real large pipe would, that's obviously high risk or whatever, or high impact, but you can't let every, you know, all the ones going to residential and business areas go to, you know, go to seed. I mean, if, if they fail, the people still don't get water. It doesn't matter where you break the pipe. So, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a complicated, problem and it's uh so but uh, i'm just concerned that the complacency from the past is like catching up with the, the industry as a whole and if we don't get uh ahead of it soon it could it could come back to bite us yeah and i i guess you know has has a has a manager of myself uh, manager of people and resources at at the u.s geological survey i know about kind of like what happens when we kind of go from one crisis to the next, you know, we're always like, right. there's a tendency to be reactive and it's really hard to kind of put time resources, um, you know, to focus kind of the, the problems, the issues that are maybe, you know, a little bit further, right. And um, to be anticipatory. Right. It's like uh, too busy putting out fires to do fire prevention. Exactly. Right. You know, so do you really want to stay in that mode? I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's often a reactive mode and it's really not helping your long term uh, survival. Any other questions? Well, we've got a few minutes.
Hey, Fred, this is uh, Gage. How you doing? Hey, Gage. Hey, question for you here. I'll turn my camera on, even though it's it's uh, it's kind of scary. I got the uh, I, got, <laughs> I got the uh, I got the COVID hair. You know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, so, yeah. Don't we all? No, so, but uh, but but I, I think maybe to expand a little bit on what you were just talking about, I'd like to hear a little bit about what you guys have been doing with the overall and kind of like the global challenge that always kind of exists out there. It's it's one thing to talk about all this stuff, right, guys or folks? It's like it's it's to talk about risk and prioritization and smart one water. Uh, it's another to actually apply it, right? So there's best practice and then there's best appropriate practice. And it's really at the end of the day, it's how do we, again, we've, we've been talking about it all morning, how you add value to people's day, right? How are we actually in improving work and management decisions? And so the challenge is really that just that translation, at least from my, in our, my experience personally, uh, working with many different utilities, is that even though the frameworks are kind of the same and the kind of decisions we want are the same, every organization, every place is different. And a lot of it is people, it's culture, uh, and it's the type of business and, and what their needs are. And so as an industry, I think it behooves us, you know, folks on this call, let's say, or all of us, you know, because I, I always say asset management and, and, and smart decisions and using these different frameworks. Listen, we've been doing asset management our whole careers. What we're trying to do now is is take all these great ideas and, and understand that these different frameworks and so forth aren't mutually exclusive they're inclusive uh, but really through you know through this kind of thought leadership sunil and, and what you've been doing for so many years with swim i think right. you know, it's, it's getting to this what fred's kind of talking about i think is is that is is, is the continued uh, application of it but understanding that there continues to be challenges to the point what you said fred starting off you were shocked. Forty percent still haven't adopted. You said uh, asset management, and 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 why? And it's and I think it's for a lot of those reasons we, we're talking about today. But but anyway, no, I think this is a really good discussion, Fred. I just want to throw that in. Yeah, it's like, kind of hard to believe. I, I just was it forty percent haven't or have? I mean, it's still bad at fifty fifty. Yeah. Well, this is uh, this is great discussion, but to try to keep us on track, uh, let's uh, move along and hear uh, another voice. Sure. Uh, and that's uh, Dr. Paolo Gar Gardoni from University of uh, Illinois Urbana-Champaign, one of the core members of uh, uh, our group trying to uh, win a NSF Engineering Research Center. Paolo. Yes, thank you, John, and. Uh... Good afternoon to all of you or good morning since we are depending on where you are in the us we might be on one side or the other day uh, i'm paolo gardoni i'm a professor in the department of civil and environmental engineering at the university of Illinois urbana champaign as john uh, already said in introducing me uh, I'll, what I'll, i've been asked to talk about is uh, stakeholders and stakeholder engagement uh, and uh, in particular with respect to how we are being uh, tackling this problem or envisioning this problem as part of the uh, Smart One Water uh, Center that uh, Sunil already um, described. So yesterday, still here, we saw uh, this uh, vignette or a cartoon where um, I believe the boss here says, we are hiring a director of change management to help employees embrace strategic changes. And then the response is, or we could come up with strategies that make sense and then employees, employees would embrace change. And uh, I don't remember somebody presented yesterday and very promptly I, I, I found it on Google and I, I use it here because I thought it was actually perfect. And the question I have then in response to this is, but how can we come up with strategies that actually make sense? And also, would that be really enough? And in fact, just before my, my presentation, there was a discussion about uh, adoption. And, and, uh, and there are probably great strategies, but why they are not adopted yet. And so we don't have the full, the full solution here, but maybe one aspect we need to think a little more about is stakeholder engagement. So I'll come back to these two questions in a second. I want to now go back to, uh, if you want, my usual slides and then talk about why stakeholder engagement is important, 
who are the stakeholders? And John already uh, asked this question in, in his opening remarks of this uh, session. When should stakeholders be engaged? There's another question because uh, Manasm doesn't have to be all the time and maybe not everybody should be engaged throughout the entire, no, all the time or all the, throughout the entire process. And also how should stakeholders be engaged? This seems to be key questions for which we need to have answers, at least ideas, in order to have a successful uh, engagement of the stakeholders. So let's start with the first one, why stakeholder engagement is actually important. We have heard during the last few days, and we know it through our day-to-day uh, -day, uh, job, that there are many technologies and sectors that are involved in uh, what we are proposing as a smart one water. And as a result, a lot of information and opinions need to be gathered. And so expertise and knowledge resides in a broad spectrum of individuals and groups and different individuals and groups are involved in the use of technologies and uh, they are affected by them. So we need to harvest this wealth of information by engaging all stakeholders and the way the more people are involved, uh, the, the, the more support in a way we have for the final solution. Um, also, different stakeholders could have different perceptions of the same problem or the same issues. They could have different priorities regarding technologies and their uses and effects. And they could have different information, opinions, expectations regarding the technologies. So in developing a successful solution, it is important to take all these different perspectives and inputs, if you want, into account. So to bring these two slides together, I would say that a solution with no or limited stakeholder engagement is typically not the best solution. And also leading with a preset solution does not engage stakeholder and does not promote acceptance of the solution or in general of change. Instead, stakeholders need to be involved in the development of the best solution and to develop buy-in and ownership. We're all part of the solution. So there is ownership in the solution we, are can, we can adopt and embrace it. So we need to work together to develop the best solution instead of simply share the solution with the stakeholders. So coming back to these two questions, we need to work with the stakeholder toward the development of the solution so that the strategies will make most sense and there will be buy-in and acceptance from the stakeholder and so that they will be embraced. So if we agree that then the stakeholder needs to be engaged, then we need to ask the question, who are the stakeholders if we do want to engage them? A stakeholder, this is a standard definition, if you want from a dictionary, is anyone who can influence or is affected by a change or think he or she is. So people or institutions that are connected with the different technologies, using the proposed solution, planning it or legislating, and are connected to those affected by the proposed solution are basically stakeholders. NSF, which is the intended sponsor for the proposed uh, Smart One Water, talks about stakeholder community, which NSF defines as uh, including all parties who may contribute to the ERC and Engineering Research Center or might be impacted by the ERC. And again, uh, quoting NSF, stakeholders can include but are not limited to relevant researchers across partner institutions with complementary research and educational expertise, industry leaders who can guide the innovation effort, partners for innovation, education, workforce development and diversity, and beneficiaries, beneficiar beneficiaries of the ERC outcomes. So community members, user, customers, patients, uh, we might not have patients here, but and policy makers. Also, we need to realize that different stakeholders might have different weights, so different roles in the uh, engagement and in the development of the solution. Then the next question that I listed earlier is, when should stakeholders be engaged? 
there are different times during a project where, where stakeholders need to be engaged. And at each time, stakeholders could actually vary. So during the early stages and then during the regular uh, development or work of the project, uh, the engagement could vary involving different stakeholders. And this is key for the success of the project. You know, so the selection of the right stakeholders over the, the life, if you want, the life cycle of the project is key. And uh, finally, we need to think about how can we make this happen once we have identified a stakeholder? How can we actually engage them? And these are some options. I mean, they're non, uh, uh, not a complete list for sure. Uh, and they could also be used in, uh, at different times and, uh, and, and the selection might be more appropriate early in the phase of the project and maybe other might be selected later on. Some of the options are developing questionnaires and surveys, interviews, field observations, workshops, focus groups, brainstorming, public fora. And so depending on the time of engagement and who the stakeholder is, one of these or two might be more appropriate than, than, than other ones. Like what we're doing today, for example, I call this a part of a stakeholder engagement with industry partners and the processes being presenting a little bit our vision, having a discussion. And I don't think we have a breakout sessions here, but if we were doing this in person, we would probably have it too. So some of the questions that we're being asking ourselves and asking outside of the center, which I think uh, could uh, give uh, some thoughts for the discussion later on. If you want to tackle any of this, we're keen on hearing your answers for this, are what are the pressing barriers to innovation in your own experience, in your own space? How do you envision new technologies like those that could be brought by smart wine water, being able to help you interact with organizations, customers, and policymakers and break down some of the current silos. What strategies or technologies is your organization considering to support new infrastructure? What have you tried and what have you learned from your past efforts? What new industry do you see, or do you foresee burgeoning as a result of, a, of the proposed smart one water technologies by the water sector industry? What are some new growth opportunities related to smart one water infrastructure? What are some policies and jurisdiction barriers to these opportunities? What changes and opportunities do you see in enabling the smart one water infrastructure for smaller communities? What else should we consider that we, are, uh, that we have not presented that we might not be thinking about and that you think is important in for the success of the smart one water. And finally, who else should be brought to the table? Going back to the stakeholder, who else should be involved beyond who is already in this virtual room? So that's all I have, John. Thank you all for listening and I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Paolo. We're going to go ahead and move on to uh, our panel members, and uh, each one of them will will provide uh, some opening remarks, and then we'll uh, move on to open discussion. If you want to start putting questions into the uh, the chat box, that would be that would be just fine. And we're going to start with uh, Anis Makawi uh, from the Hampton Road Sanitation District. Anis, thank you, John. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, I wanted to, since this discussion is about stakeholder engagement, you know, when I was invited to talk in this session, I was thinking in my mind, I'm, I'm not the subject matter expert in this area whatsoever. Uh, but then I got to thinking about it and I'm like, who is, who really is? And it, it's really a shared responsibility. This specific area is a shared responsibility across the industry, across any organization, across any department, everyone's responsibility to communicate with those around them uh, the value and you know, what we're doing and why it's important to, to everyone. Um, so I, I wanted to share, one, I only have one slide. 
I'll share it here real quick. And I really wanted to center my, dis center my discussion around this. So uh, my title in HRSD is the Chief of Asset Management. And I've been in that role for, I've been in that role for five years now. And when I came into that position, um, you know, the big discussion was, well, there's going to be a lot of change. And, you know, you heard Fred mention earlier, you know, 40, 50% of utilities are not doing asset management. It's kind of surprising. And he's right. I mean, th that's not even possible. When people ask me how long you've been doing asset management, I say since 1940, that's when the organization started. And that's when we started managing our assets. In reality, we've always been doing asset management. But the question is, how are we going to do it going forward? So there's going to be some changes in how we do asset management. Asset management is nothing new. It's just the framework of how we're going to be doing going forward is going to change. So I saw this graphic uh, and there's the reference there of where it came from, a framework for thinking about systems change. And I really, really liked it because it kind of um, a, a quick way of showing what's actually needed for change. And the first thing is vision. You, know, you really got to describe why, you know, this change is important to the organization, to the customers, to the different stakeholders. Um, the second thing you need is the skills. Do you have the skills to actually implement that change? The third thing is the incentives. What's in it for all of the stakeholders? Is there something in it for them? The fourth thing is resources. Do we have the right resources, whether it's human resources, financial resources, equipment, any type of resources that are needed to implement that change, do we have that? And finally, an action plan, a good solid action plan for implementing that change. And it shows you here below kind of what happens if you are missing any of these. So if you're missing, missing the vision, it leads to confusion because people don't understand why they're doing it. You know, you may by executive order or by mandate saying thou shall do it. However, it does lead to confusion from the staff or from the public in terms of why it's actually happening. So that's not necessarily a successful change if you don't have that vision. If you're missing the skills, then it leads to anxiety. So if, if, if people don't know what they're doing or they don't have the proper training or they don't have the proper resources, it's just gonna lead to anxiety. If you don't have the incentives, people don't know what's in it for them, it leads to resistance. And we, you heard the term resistance a lot through, throughout this conference and throughout any change that you implement, you always gotta be mindful of the, the folks that are gonna be resisting that change. Um, and, and one of the best ways to avoid that resistance is to uh, offer some incentives or at least tell them what's in it for them. If it's not monetary incentives or vacations or anything, some of the incentives that we, tangible incentives that we think about, uh, it's more maybe communicating the vision of the why and what's in it for them in a way that they are encouraged and they see that it is an incentive to them. And in terms of resources, if you're missing the resources, it does lead, lead to frustration. Uh, if you have staff and you're trying to implement change and you're saying you got to do X, Y, Z, and they say, we, we just don't have the time. Uh, if you give me two more people, I may be able to do it, but it's frustrating that you're asking me to do all this when I just don't have the human resources to, to actually do it. And if you're missing the action plan, a roadmap, a good uh, plan for how you're going to implement the change, and it leads to false starts. And once that false start happens, it loses the confidence of all of the stakeholders, which you start losing all of the other, you start losing resources, you start losing incentives, skills, and vision, everything else kind of falls up if you don't have a good action plan. So that's kind of what I centered the implementation of our asset management program at HRSD on is this, this graph here. And we try to you know, make sure that we have each one of those. So from a vision perspective, we, we did put a vision statement, which is making the right investment at the right time. That is the vision for asset management at HRSD. And when we tried to communicate that, we said, you know, that investment is nowhere talking about our CIP. When people think investment, they're thinking the CIP, they're thinking, how are we investing in infrastructure? But what we tried to communicate was, you know, we're talking also about resources. If we're talking about maintenance, we're talking about making sure that we have the right amount of staff and the right resources to, to do the job. Uh, so there could be some incentives for you that we're adding new staff because the goal of asset management is to extend the life of assets at the lowest life cycle cost. So that's part of the, the other part of the vision that, that we communicated. 
and, and we kind of um, went through this graph here and you know, made, made sure we address each of those items to, to be able to uh, implement the uh, change. And from my talk yesterday, for those who were there, you know, we are implementing the sustainable water initiative for tomorrow, our aquifer recharge program, uh, where the goal is to have 100 million gallons per day uh, recharging the Potomac aquifer in uh, Virginia um, on a daily basis. And uh, that has many advantages for the region as a whole. It's not just an HRSD advantage. It's not just a customer's advantage. Um, it, 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 it's going to save some rates from uh, not necessarily our rates. Our rates might go up. But then, you know, when we're when we started this program, we had to identify the stakeholders and we said, well, who are our stakeholders? It's not just the people paying rates. Uh, it's also the localities. You know, the, the Chesapeake Bay restoration requires us to make sure that there's certain nutrients going into the Chesapeake Bay. Well, we're one of the primary polluters in the Chesapeake Bay because of our wastewater treatment plants. We have 16 of them. Um, but there's also runoff from the streets and we don't own the stormwater systems. That's the localities that own those. And there's MS4 regulations that say, you know, you need to put in BMPs to reduce that uh, waste load going into the Chesapeake Bay. Well, we're saying now, if we free up all of those nutrients that we're, you know, right now we're um, discharging to the Chesapeake Bay, that frees up that waste load uh, for stormwater to not invest in the infrastructure needed to uh, reduce the waste load into the uh, Chesapeake Bay. So yeah, we may increase our rates, but the localities don't have to increase their rates to, to invest in that infrastructure. So there was a lot of coordination and collaboration with the localities. Um, from a utility perspective, the, the, it really all boils down to uh, affordability and, and funding. And if you're able to find ways to be efficient uh, doing more with less, then, then it's definitely a sell, whether it's technology, whether it's resources, whether it's whatever you're trying to implement, um, having that efficiency uh, value proposition is, is the winning point. Um, and, and that's kind of what we try to communicate with regulators, with localities, with customers, with anyone impacted by any change that we're, uh, we're doing. So that's kind of the, uh, the gist of what I wanted to talk about. Uh, today and then uh, we'll uh, open it up for the uh, uh, panel discussion after a couple of more folks speak, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Makawi. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, next, we'd like to uh, invite Dr. Pierre Glenn from uh, the US Geological Survey to give us a few opening thoughts. Pierre, can you share Thanks. Uh, yep, let me, uh, um, there we go. Perfect. Yep, all right, <laughs> thank you. Um, so I, I just want to, um, uh, you know, uh, talk a, a, a bit about uh, two, two um, concepts that I've been working on that um, maybe uh, helpful to the community and to the discussion here. And so the first one is the idea of participatory modeling or modeling with stakeholders. Now, when we talk about modeling, we don't, you know, it could be development of a numerical model or an agent-based model, or it could be simply development of a, a conceptual model, right? Or a mental model. <laughs> it's basically a process by which you know, we get um, stakeholders to engage, to bring in their, their implicit and explicit knowledge and, um, and, and to start describing, you know, um, their representations of reality, right? So the definition is right there on, on the screen. It's a purposeful learning process for action that engages the implicit and explicit knowledge of stakeholders to create formalized and shared representations of reality. And it's a co-creation process, right? So yes, you know, you have to identify, you know, the stakeholders, um, you have to make decisions about the frequencies, how you're gonna do, you know, the governance of the process, of the whole engagement process, right? And how are you going to go from uh, just talk into 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 practice? So there's there's really a lot to consider. 
there's quite a number of tools that have been used and they, they go, you know, there's a, th these are some of the, the tools and they go from very qualitative tools like role-playing games. You know, some of this is like facilitation um, or other types of, of games, you know, serious games, other types of games, brainstorming, um, all the way to, um, you know, pretty sophisticated quantitative uh, modeling. The, the point is that there's, there's a lot of methodologies and, and tools that, it, that can be used to kind of bring stakeholders together to, to get the wisdom of the stakeholders, i.e. the wisdom of the crowd, right? And, uh, and their independent perspectives and knowledge lines and um, into something that hopefully makes sense. And, um, and this has been used actually, you know, across the world in including in communities that don't know how to read and write it hasn't really been formally used too often in the United States, although it has been used for the, for example, in connection to the Flint water crisis, okay? Um, by folks at the Michigan State University, there's a big group there on, on participatory modeling. So the other thing I wanted to talk about is, is uh, an idea that I came up with because of my involvement in participatory modeling and so forth, which was the idea of creating records of engagement and decision-making. And so, you know, at USGS, the organization that I work with all the time, we'll bring our science, we ask, you know, um, we can benefit, you know, um, decisions that are made by uh, regulators, policymakers, et cetera. At the end of the day, there isn't too much of a record that's, that's there um, that's readily accessible, you know, to actually <laughs> look at, you know, what, what was brought in to the discussions. You might have minutes of meetings. Um, often the minutes, you know, will mention the facts, the data that were brought in, but they won't necessarily mention like the values that different constituencies expressed, right? Um, the emotions, the group dynamics, those types of things that are really, you know, really hard. And so the whole concept of creating a record of engagement decision-making is not to have like perfect transparency on this because actually, you know, there's many reasons why sometimes, you know, total transparency is a, is, is a problem, right? And so, but to have an increased transparency on the different factors that, you know, um, describe a, a, a stakeholder engagement that the that describe how you know um, the discussion, the engagement evolved, what were the commitments that were made, and so forth. And the the whole idea is really to provide um, uh, you know to, to provide some some transfer values. Stakeholder engagements are expensive. It's expensive, you know, in terms of people's times and resources to come together to 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 discuss something to you know, to make this in, this effort. And often, you know, that that effort, you know, uh, seems to be lost. And so increasing, you know, the transfer value of the effort so that it can be it can be used for similar types of situations elsewhere, or, you know, to see has a, a particular system or issue evolves in a particular locale to see, you know, okay, why did people before come to the decisions that they, they, they did, right? You'd like to have kind of that historical knowledge so that you can better, um, you know, build on that rather than, than start from zero. Um, it also help create a reward system. It does tend to modulate, you know, behavior. If people know that they're being observed or recorded or something that does affect behavior, right? Um, it can incentivize accountability and responsibility and facilitate follow-up. And so follow-up, you know, to kind of like critical sustainability, sustainability, so that it's not just something, decisions that are made are not just for, you know, a few pol politicians in, in at one moment in time or a few managers at one moment in time, but actually there's you know, there's follow um, through. Um, and so especially for things that need that, that's important. So this is a slide with, you know, some of these, these things that could be included in a record of engagement and decision-making ideally, right? 
Um, and I don't necessarily want to take uh, time to do this, but we have a paper on this that has a table with these things. Um, we also did a, you know, you don't need a record of engagement and decision making necessarily all the time, okay? And so judging when you need one and when you need one is important. And the idea is, is to do it when, you know, for the more complex issues um, where all these factors are important, right? Where there's a, a, a temporal, an important temporal aspect where there's trade-offs, right? That's the type of, of uh, system or issue where we need uh, records of engagement and decision making. BBHV stands for biases, beliefs, heuristics, and values. You know, it's kind of like the human dimensions that often guide, you know, uh, what we do, right? Or what we choose to do. It's not just uh, facts and, and, you know, very facts and some scientific truths, right? So, um, <laughs> there's there's lots of gray areas and so we need to document that when it's not warranted when well maybe you're never going to get the stakeholders to trust each other okay the power asymmetries between different constituencies or 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 stakeholders are way too great there's no point in engaging everybody if it's the end of the day it's going to be my way or the highway and you know it's just not it's not uh, an honest effort to engage um you know, sometimes having transparency can actually, uh, too much transparency can cause schisms. You know, you can push people into articulating their sacred beliefs that they're not going to, uh, you know, move from. And okay, so all kinds of things, or it's a, it's just a simple issue, right? So anyway, we need systems thinking, we need engagement of stakeholders, um, especially, you know, to anticipate, you know, problems and so forth. And uh, and I would argue that you know creating kind of uh, <laughs> uh, better accounting and um, through and and in, increased transparency through having these these records um, would be would hopefully be helpful. How to do it? There's lots of challenges, and I would love to get comments on that um, separately. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Glenn. And last but uh, not least, I'd like to invite Barry Matthews from the Virginia Department of Health to provide a few remarks. Thank you, John. So um, I'm Barry Matthews. I'm the Director of Training, Capacity Development and Outreach. Um, so my primary mission is to work with small waterworks across Virginia. And I've got a couple of photos to share if I can get to them. So for the work that we do, engagement and outreach for the purpose of assisting smaller rural communities can be quite challenging, especially in a technically driven industry. Using data for predictive modeling is oftentimes beyond the grasp of well-intentioned dedicated water utility managers. To achieve engagement across all groups of water utilities requires directed, continuous effort by many groups of technical assistance providers. When we talk about diversity and inclusion within the Smart One water community, I think of the small towns that are pictured here um, in these photographs. Towns that may have as few as one full-time employee, uh, that may have part-time operators or where the mayor even uh, may be operating the drinking water system. Includes, inclusion of these groups of utilities um, that often serve less than 3,300 people uh, will not be easy as we talk about diversity and inclusion, we need to remember that that means staff at rural water associations, rural community assistance projects, regulatory agencies, and technical assistance providers like the Environmental Finance Center Network. Also, the American Water Works Association, and there are many other technical assistance providers across the nation working with utilities just to keep the systems operating. 
an example of what I'm talking about, I'd, I'd like to tell a story. There's a small town in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia that struggles with its utilities. They operate both a drinking water and a wastewater system. The town recently replaced their gas chlorination with a temporary liquid sodium hypochlorite feed due to a staff injury from the chlorine gas. A review of the town's monthly operation reports by my staff indicated that the drinking water system had exceeded 80% of its design capacity level. Further discussions and meetings with the town revealed the town hauled very large amounts of water during months when water loss was at its worst. Almost a million gallons of water had to be hauled in for a town with a population of 1,145 persons. During a team meeting, my staff decided that leak detection by the Virginia Rural Water Association should take place immediately in order to decrease the average daily design capacity below the 80% threshold prior to any other actions being taken like a small projects engineering grant or a planning grant that the Office of Drinking Water provides. Because of these issues and others, the town con contracted with a local company to operate the utilities. The contractor reached out to my staff and we contacted the local field office of the Department of Health Office of Drinking Water. My staff contacted Virginia Rural Water Association and arranged for leak detection services. Four rural water uh, staff blanketed the distribution system along with the town staff and contracted operator personnel. DRWA staff utilized equipment funded by the Office of Drinking Water. One group used a correlator to test pipe in areas thought likely to have water leaks not surfacing. The other group set up pressure gauges on a remote section of 12 inch water pipe to check for pressure loss that would indicate, indicate a leak. After installing gauges, the team began to sweep through various neighborhoods, visually looking for signs of leaks and electronically listening for each valve and meter. Field office staff confirmed the town required assistance regarding improperly in, an improperly installed treatment system. ODW provided a small project engineering services grant for plans and specifications. And as a result, modifications were made to the temporary sodium hypochlorite system. And the town was able to continue to use that form of disinfection. The leak detection effort found 16 or more leaks and repaired them during the month of February, 2020. And several more have been found since that time. The work and effort put forth by these vested organizations has resulted in a reduction of design capacity from over 90% to currently approximately 55%. And the, the town no longer has to haul supplemental water in for its residents. The town and its leadership is dedicated to providing the 1145 customers with the best drinking water that they can produce. The mayor is engaged the town contracts for utility operations, and they reach out to the Office of Drinking Water when they need assistance. They do what they can to provide reliable, a reliable resource to their community. Predictive modeling, smart water, one water, digital twins, these are concepts that this town doesn't have the capacity to employ. In fact, they aren't even aware of some of these uh, resources. Does this mean that we need to leave these kinds of towns behind? From one of the talks uh, two days ago, does this town need too many boxes to see over the fence? So what can we do to ensure diversity and inclusion? The, Di the Virginia Department of Health Office of Drinking Water spends a tremendous amount of resources providing assistance to small towns and communities like this all over Virginia. So a lot of my colleagues had a lot of questions, but I've only got one. What can the Smart One Water community do to help us help those small utilities?
Thank you very much, Barry. And that's a that's a good question. And and maybe we'll kick it off with that. Is there is there someone that would like to to wade in on Barry's question? If, if I may, um, this is Pierre. Um, I you know I think <laughs> so. Uh, you know, as we um, there's an effort to apply for an NSF engineering research center. Obviously, you know, um, we're going to look at um, all the different technical um, solutions, use of AI, and so forth. I would, I would say to answer your question, Barry, though, I would say that um, a critical piece of the answer is not just, you know, for the, the small towns that you describe, is not just like... Um, you know, finding technical solutions. Yes, that can be an important part of it, but it's also thinking about it from kind of like the, you know, hu the human dimensions, the motivations of folks. Um, you know, some of the, what um, uh, Anas, you know, said earlier in his, his talk is, is really pertinent. If, if um, we need to find ways for people to come together, to engage, to, for communities to kind of like, you know, take the time, make the effort, um, you know, plan for the future, right? And so this is not just a management challenge for managers, it's also a challenge for, for communities and um, to set aside resources to, to um, you know, be able to, when there is, you know, um, a, a critical failure or before that, hopefully, <laughs> that there are the funds, you know, needed to available to, to um, you know, to do, to have a replacement schedule. Those types of things I think are really important. And, and I agree, Pierre, but to me, it's not a matter of funding, um, really, um, because when you're dealing with these small pounds that have um, one assistant that's also the treasurer and the mayor's running out and doing the, uh, the water system uh, monitoring, uh, no amount of money is going to give them the technical uh, capacity to put together a project that could leverage the kinds of data that we're establishing through this Smart One Water Initiative. So money helps but it's really the personal relationships that mm -hmm. drive the engagement. And that's kind of what I was trying to tell in that story. You know, it's, it's hard in a, in a quick story to tell the whole story, but there are a lot of people in that story coming together to resolve that town's problems. And that's a fire drill story, like somebody was saying earlier. That's not fire prevention. Mm -hmm. Getting to that next level to prevent those things from happening from the beginning requires a tremendous amount of resources. And we provide that kind of service as well out of capacity development in the Office of Drinking Water. But it, it's not just about money, it's about personal relationships and getting in front of people and talking to them and really having that positive relationship with that community. Right, but the, you know, time time is a resource, right? Time and what you're oh, describing, <laughs> and FaceTime is a is a is a resource, right? And so, so you, you know, so I, I totally I totally get I, I agree what you know is what you're saying. I guess my my question back to you is, you know, how do we incentivize? You know, um, you know, first of all, how do we incentivize that that kind of like um, engagement and face time that's needed, and development of, of relationships that you describe, and also do an honest accounting of its cost because, you know, um, when you're doing that, that means that you're automatically not doing something else, right? And so, um... <laughs> well, and and that's that's a big part of it, right? Because of the diversity and inclusion piece that we've talked about, um, you know, how much time investment and how much effort do we want to make to include some of these small systems uh, into a process um, that can use the kind of predictive modeling and the uh, 
types of data information that, that we're talking about. Um, it would require a tremendous amount of resources to get some of these small towns included. Right. Uh, uh, let me add to that, Barry. What you brought is that was the main mo motivation. Walter is here online. I debated this, that these small town is providing water to the same citizens. I mean, they are not second grade citizen of US, right? So why can't we provide, like people who has a smartphone, they can use WhatsApp, Facebook. In India, I am seeing the people in India, they now have all these uh, technology available, just they have to buy a smartphone. And in India, most of the data service is kind of very cheap. So that's my whole point here is even in the pipe ID project, that's what I talked in the beginning, we worked with big utilities because we needed data, we needed to build all these models. But now my whole uh, focus is how to engage this small. They don't need all this data. I mean, even if they have basic, we have most of the data we downloaded from USGS. USGS has spent millions of dollars to collect the data. So why we, we, can't we leverage those things and provide the service to this small utility? I understand they have limited resources. They cannot hire a GIS guy. They don't have to. They just have to log into server. I'm not saying Virginetech server, but any, this is smart one water organization server, they should get everything, right? Just like we don't care about Google facilities and all those, we just want a street map and we get it. Hey, Barry, this is uh, Ken Thompson. Yeah, I, I understand this is a, a, this is a major capacity issue within the organization, within small systems. And, and one thought is that, you know, let's start, let's take baby steps and start, start simple on it. Uh, something like um, the ability to know when the pressure goes out by having a few sensors at key parts of the system and something that goes to their app that says, I have a low pressure. Something that's going to help them real time understand their, their what's happening without investing, without creating a lot of um, uh, requirements to learn advanced technologies. And, and I think the idea is, to, is meet with these different systems and ask them, what one piece of data would help you operate your system more effectively? And let's see if there's a simple way to, to put this together and, and use what they already know how to use. They all, they all have smartphones. Let's use a right. smartphone as, right. as an right. example. Oh, right. And Ken, you are right. In the pipe, I did the same thing. Like there are 80 parameters which affect the performance of the pipe, but we don't need 80 parameters. We just need basic five or 10. That's it. I think what's being described is really, uh, um, you know, an, an efficiency issue in many ways. I mean, the, I, I totally agree that having, you know, smart sensors, having having, you know, real time sensing and so forth, you know, can can help um, provide that kind of efficiency that's needed. I think it's also a kind of on, in terms of the human dimensions. It's also really important for the people who do engage in various participatory processes and so forth to to kind of see, you know, be able to see that their engagement, you know, produces meaningful results, right? That it's not just, uh, okay, um, they came, government listened, and, um, but it was more pro forma to be able to say, you know, that they were listening. And, but actually, you know, if, if they can see the results of, you know, their input and how it's being taken in and, um, and listen to seriously and how they're affecting change, people are much more likely to be motivated to engage. Um, and so it's kind of like the, you know, it's sort of this, the, there's an analogy there with kind of the sensors, right? The sensors, sensors are in a, in a way they can be very sophisticated, you know, from a technological perspective, but, you know, they don't also don't have actually have the complexities of, of human beings, right? And so, <laughs> and so, uh, and they don't have motivations, right? <laughs> so I think we need uh, efficiencies all, all around. And Sunil, you mentioned India. Um, the diagram that I showed was the different methods and tools for participatory modeling. Mm -hmm. That was in a paper by Alexei Voinov and others um, in our succinct participatory modeling group. And um, we had some case studies in that paper. And one of the case studies was actually a small community in India that you know, did participatory modeling to address a groundwater depletion uh, problem. And so um, 
I, I encourage people to, 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 to look at that. Sure. But no, Barry, what the point you brought is very important. And that as we are building this smart one water, looking into all predictive modeling, AI, but if it's not going to help a small utilities, then that shouldn't be our success story then for the CRC. You know, and, and I'll just, I, I was Googling something a minute ago because I remembered something I'd heard uh, not, not that long ago, I think. Uh, but uh, that, you know, there are 2 million people in the United States that don't have running water or, or basic plumbing in their houses. So, um, and this, this is not going to solve that problem, at least in the short term. But, you know, and, and it, just like the internet has not uh, provided uh, access to everyone, this will not solve all problems for everyone, but we can make a difference. Right. And, and we can make a difference with, with many of these small utilities and maybe get a few more people connected. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to go in a little bit of a different direction. And, and Pierre, um, could you put back up your slide on um, the record of, of uh, agreement and uh, decision-making? Or engagement. Yeah, sure. Um, let me let me share my screen again. And yeah. and I guess the the question that I have is that you said that you know we keep meeting minutes and and records of decisions and and things like that, um, and then you you uh, you implied that that wasn't cutting it so. Could you give us a couple of descriptions of what these records actually look like? So uh, how do you have records of stakeholder perspectives and group dynamics, for example? Right, so, so uh, yeah, so maybe this is, this is a kind of like, a, this, this is, is kind of a vis more visual summary of uh, what, I, what I have here, right? Um, you know, I guess you know. The first thing is is you know we're we're working on creating some records of engagement and decision making. Uh, for example, I've got some colleagues in New Zealand that are um, trying to set something up for the Lake Taupo um, uh, system, which is a you know a, a lake that actually has similarities with Lake Tahoe here in in Nevada, right? Um, and you know they've there's different constituencies. Uh, it's about you know, the issues are about um, preserving, on one hand, preserving, um, you know, the, the lake and, uh, you know, the, so, that, so that it has um, uh, recreation opportunities, it, it keeps its ecological health and so forth. And then on the other side, you know, um, having control on nutrients, nutrient management and so forth for the farmers uh, around the lake and so forth, right? So, and balancing, you know, various needs. And so, they're trying to do something like this, um, you know, but frankly, you know, what I described is not, you know, to my knowledge, we don't have anything yet like this. And it's an ideal concept or an idealistic concept. I get it, <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's lots of challenges. I don't want to minimize that, but I think we need to make progress in terms of like doing better, going beyond kind of minutes of meetings and, you know, Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it does exist. Maybe there is something that's been set up that has, you know, all these things. In my view, this would be like a, a website or, um, uh, you know, some type of, of um, repository, you know, sort of like a repository, but, but something that actually can evolve with time, right? And, um, and, and, and that would, would, you know, uh, has more information comes in could be built on right so there's all kind of how you do this and how you make it something that's useful you don't want necessarily to you know the problem with minutes of meetings and so forth is that people don't read them and it's very, they're very linear and uh, maybe they go into way too much detail right and so ideally you want this this record of engagement and decision making to kind of give a very broad abstract kind of systems to systems perspective and then the different constituencies, different experts, different people want to dig into different aspects than they can. So you can go from the general to the specific, you know, in some pretty, uh, pretty easy ways. And so that means that you don't necessarily, you don't really have uh, something that's just uh, kind of a 
text, right? Uh, a linear text. Um, how you do that? Again, like we're working on it. We've got a number of groups. Um, you know, we've got also a group in Australia that's that's um, trying to set this up for um, actually to look at environmental impact statements. Um, it's you know, so you know, it's not it, in a way. It relates to facilitation. It relates to keeping records, but I don't actually know of anything you know, that's been set up yet that really has everything that I'd like to see here. So Peer, is it like a similar, we had this four day, I'm working with my students and all those we will spend next week time, uh, all Zoom recording we have then, but we are not going to throw this whole Zoom recording eight hours every day, right? Yet, uh, right? So what we are trying to do is I will sit with my student, of course, the student has to help me to chunk these all and put it in a structured way with presentation, then topic like federal. That's why we organized this whole conference right. into the theme and all those. So I'm trying to get a storyline that how we ran four day, right. what we learned. So is it that similar what you are talking? Uh, to some extent, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. as, as you know, stories are, are really critical. Narratives, mm -hmm. stories, you mm -hmm. know, um, the mm -hmm. type of, of story that actually Barry, you know, provided are absolutely critical and mm -hmm. that's, to grab on, that's how we think about things, right? Mm -hmm. Say this rack of engagement and decision making, it has to it has to have the ability to kind of like, you know, provide those stories or help people, um, you know, with those stories so that they actually engage, right? Mm -hmm. If you if you just give a bunch of dry facts or mm -hmm. or something like that nobody's going to pay attention, right? And so. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's got to have the, the right labels, you know, um, mm -hmm. what some people call memes, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in essence, you know, what it is, is it has to have the right simplifications that create some type of, of uh, connection or emotional response, right? So that people get interested in it. And then, and then you, know, you know, if they want, they can get dig deeper right and so right, right, right. um so if you wanted to do like a regular engagement for our you know the smart one water workshop no, right, Pierre, sure Pierre. you can organize it different ways you can put tags on things oh, right, right, right. um but what's even is actually how do you capture Pierre, I, I think express. that I, I really like your model here. Um, and what it reminds me of mostly is um, local jurisdiction public meeting uh, framework and how they have to set up uh, public meetings um, that are formal public meetings and they have to go through all these various steps. But mm -hmm. um, in that process, uh, you get to the end point and like you say, who's going to read the 30 to 40 pages um, because you know the, the records of decisions are buried within the, the text of the body of the public meeting. So it needs to be pulled out and, and easily discernible and easily digested out of that whole process. But it does remind me very much of a formal public meeting kind of process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how how would you feel about you know? Uh, <laughs> so I, I thought about this. Uh, um, you know, I, I thought you know like one 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 of the things maybe I I'd, um, in there that um, uh, y you know the things that we could we could bring in we could we might be able to use technology to actually help was the creation of these records, right? And um, uh, let me see if I can, um, uh, all right, let me, let me stop share and share the other one here. Uh, um, yeah, all right, so how do I go back to share here? Here. Yeah. Oh. 
So, you know, what if, so again, this is like, this, some of this is going to go against like some of our norms if, uh, you know, and, and, and that we have with respect to privacy and so forth. How would you, you know, think about that small town meeting, Barry and others and, and say, okay, now what if you had, what if you had uh, machine perception? What if you had, you know, um, some machine that was uh, looking at, that was doing natural language processing, that was looking at the emotions expressed, you know, based on the tone of people's voice and so forth, categorizing those emotions, that was actually doing various types of visual recognition, right? You know, to kind of capture some of the emotions, some of the, uh, right? And some of the intensity of beliefs. Now, you could think that that, <laughs> that could um, happen. Now, people wouldn't necessarily want to have that kind of like that level of intrusion, right, on their privacy. So then you could think about like various ways to kind of pervert, you know, preserve some of that privacy and so forth, right, and still get some, um, you know, some uh, some meaningful result here. My, my point is simply that, you know, we could think about technology also in terms of like assisting, you know, the facilitation of these meetings, assisting in the creation of these records and the categorization of things, you know, the simplifications. It's a huge challenge. I, I don't, you know, what I'm saying is, is it seems like, okay, technology would come to the rescue and simple and it's figured, no, no. <laughs> but it, it's really complicated, but I think, you know, um, this is the world that we're going towards, right? A lot of this is being done right now. And, no. you know, it's not just the, it's not just the, the high tech uh, things, right? So it's also, um, you know, uh, what is it? Um, uh, I had another, um, another slide, maybe I put it afterwards. This was the Lake Taupo uh, issue. Um, so oh. while you're looking that, for that, there are a couple things on the chat. Um, uh, Christabel Ferguson talked about the Australia Re Water Resource Plans. Could you uh, uh, talk about that briefly? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so in Australia, one of the biggest uh, watersheds that is most significant to Australia is the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, it's a very, very large area, it covers most of New South Wales, it, it crosses five separate states and it's the most productive agricultural region in the country. Um, I was actually in charge of the New South Wales um, policy and planning team that actually had to pull together water resource plans. So because of the significance of the basin, the federal government actually enacted legislation that required each of the states that had watersheds in the Murray-Darling Basin to produce a water resource plan for each watershed. And that included the groundwater aquifers as well. Um, so for each individual surface water watershed or groundwater aquifer, there had to be a complete water resource plan put in place, including a legislative instrument that governs how the water was shared and how the water would be used um, and how the water would be managed, including limits on trading and limits on irrigation water um, extraction. Um, these plans included a, a lot of scientific information that was pulled together to support them. So there were specific scientific requirements that had to be produced for each plan, including risk assessments, ecosystem evaluations, et cetera. All of that scientific information had to be assessed and evaluated by a committee for each water resource plan. So there were designated um, committees that the policy and planning team actually put together. We had professional facilitators to, to actually um, run those meetings for us. We would produce um, the reports and the scientific reports would be presented to the stakeholder committees and groups. And so as each piece of scientific information became available about each plan, that would be presented to the stakeholder group. And the stakeholder group was made up of irrigators, environmental representatives, local government representatives, indigenous groups, um, and state government representatives. So, so there was the whole, the idea was to get a cross section of the community and those representatives actually discussed um, a lot of the, the technical content and the science that, that needed to be 
um, you know, evaluated in order to make sure that the actual legislation that got put in place was going to be appropriate and fair and equitable for everybody and also sustainable. Um, separate to that, the planning, um, the planning process also included open stakeholder engagement. So we would do a formal advertisement in the newspaper, ask people to make submissions. People could make anonymous submissions. They could write a letter and say, I'm worried about X, Y, Z. Um, and all of that information was captured by the policy and planning team and responded to and went into the process. So there was multiple lines of communication and evidence, everything from newspapers to public meetings, the stakeholder engagement group, the websites, the website reports, social media, like it was a very holistic process and all of that information um, was collated and evaluated and used in the process to come up with the decisions that were made and then that water resource plan and all that information then had to be submitted to um, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, which was the federal government's agency charged with evaluating the, the satisfactory nature of those plans. So you basically had to get an approval of your plan for it to be implemented and you had to meet the federal government requirements. So it's a very, very large and ongoing process um, and it involved you know, multiple levels of stakeholder engagement. If I, if I may, uh, Christabel, I, I, first of all, I, I really admire actually a lot of what's being done in Australia. And um, I'm working with Tony Jakeman at uh, oh, Australian uh, National yeah, I know him very well. yeah, University. Really and so he's, he's um, you know, he and, and some of his uh, colleagues and students, you know, um, you know, are working on the record of engagement decision. Yes, I work with uh, them, yeah. Yeah, process. And, and then also yeah. folks at uh, University of Technology, Sydney. Oh, yeah, um, good. Uh, uh, Alexei um, Moynoff was whom I've worked and who's part of the, like I said, the participatory modeling community and mm -hmm. and we're sharing, um, you know, we have a PhD student actually, Pete Dupin, who's, uh, oh, great. who's trying to set something up. But so, uh, so let me ask you a question with respect to what you described. So you had all this engagement and all, all these yep. different media and so forth, right? Yep. Okay, how did you, how, at the end of the day, How's it brought together and organized to, um, you know, kind of facilitate, you know, efficient use and. Uh... Sorry, broke up just a little bit at the end. How is it organized? Efficient how use? is it organized altogether? I mean, the problem is like, yes, you know, what I see is like you have video, you have minutes, yeah. you have this, that and the other, you know, yeah. it's put out by maybe different groups around yep. the same issue, right? Yeah. Yep. How do you organize it, you know, put it together in a way that then helps, um, <laughs> you know, navigate efficiently through the information, right? Yep, yep. Most and of it, most of it provides good transfer value for the future or for yep. other systems. Yeah, look, I mean, it's it's twofold, really. I mean, the repository of the information is the state government's website. So the state government department has all of that material and it's all archived on the website under the water resource plan area so that anyone can go and actually access it and download, you know, the risk assessment document or the minutes of the meeting or, you know, whatever component it is. They can get a list of who made individual submissions unless someone's made it anonymous, obviously. Um, but... You know, the website was the major tool, but I think that the thing that's often, I, I like your question, because I think the thing that is often underestimated in that process is the actual knowledge in people's heads of the people who had been involved in the process over many years. So we had some of the stakeholder representatives in those groups that, that were being managed who had, you know, been on that committee for... I don't know, maybe 10 years, 12 years, some, some of them. So they had actually been present involved in the first water sharing plan that had been made for, for that watershed. And there's a requirement in New South Wales that each sharing plan has to be reviewed every 10 years. There were people on the committee who, who I was working with in the revision of some of our sharing plans who had been there for the first plan. And those people had so much knowledge about why particular decisions had been made and why particular provisions had been put in the legislation that mm -hmm. that that was actually a real added benefit and a real um, 
you know, a real source of knowledge to newer people who were coming into the committee and hadn't been, and didn't have that history. So, so I think it is very challenging to actually capture that, um, that, that inherent knowledge that people have that, that have the familiarity with the resources. Um, and that is one of the key challenges, I think, is being able to access and retain that kind of knowledge. Um, yeah, so, so. Doing it perfectly. <laughs> And, and John, feel free to cut me off if I'm taking too too long or other people, you know, feel free to jump in if you want. Yeah, uh, I don't in. want to pay too much time here. But, you know, Paolo in his presentation earlier, he talked about, um, you know, different stakeholders having different weights, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, and so you, and you can look at it at the weights from, okay, who's got the weight question from the perspective of who's got, you know, uh, the right expertise at the right time. You can look at it also from issues of equity, right? Yep. There's yep. dimensions, you know, that you kind of might might pos potentially consider to look at this issue of weights, right? Who, in 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 terms of a facilitation process, in terms of the recording process, you know, <laughs> how do you how do you you know what kind of governance principles do you have? Yeah. Right okay. to to yeah. create you know the efficiency that is needed at the end of the day in terms of helping with the actual engagement right yeah. and also in terms of uh, doing a good job in terms of what needs to be recorded and so forth. Yeah, right? look, that that's a really good point, and and to be honest, the government had to mandate um, some of that because some of that um, inequity would have persisted if, if the government hadn't mandated. And, and the specific example I could give, which is the easiest one to point to, is that the federal government mandated that Indigenous groups had to be consulted and represented and that every water resource plan had to consider Aboriginal cultural values and spiritual um, considerations. Mm. So, so that was a massive um, you know, line in the sand that that it certainly had not been addressed in previous, um, you know, mm -hmm. stakeholder engagements that have been done. And that has, that has really pushed things forward in terms of um, ensuring greater equity for that group and greater representation for that specific group in the whole process. So. Christabel, well, th this yeah. is Barry. And I have a question for you because you talk about people that have decades of experience and what I call institutional knowledge. And a lot of it is recorded and it's available in the information, but it's easier to talk to that person, right? Yeah. And get it straight from them. What I've seen in the US, and I was wondering if you've seen this happen uh, in Australia, is those people with that high level of institutional knowledge see newcomers come in and try to take kind of control over the process. And those people with all that information start shutting down because you know they've been there for the decades and they're not really being listened to and they know the mistakes that have been made in the past. And when, as we're talking about engagement, what I see is that institutional knowledge gets kind of run over by the passion and some of the, the exuberance of youth, if you will. Is that same kind of thing happening there? I mean, or is that just a, Americans? <laughs> no, I, I, think that, I think that's humans. Um, so, so I would agree that, that that can happen. It was one of the reasons why um, when, when I was basically put in a, in a role where I could make a difference about that, I actually employed professional facilitators to host the right. meetings. So I brought in external third parties who were in independent consultants who had knowledge of specifically the water sector, um, but weren't, weren't, being, um, weren't facilitating meetings in areas where they lived, right? So they had, okay. they had to make sure they had no conflict of interest. So they actually were looking after um, a water resource plan for a different area of the state to where they live but they had enough knowledge of the water sector and the issues to, to be able to facilitate a meeting and ensure that everybody got heard. Um, and, you know, I keep, yes, some, some of the stakeholders, like some of the irrigators have been on some of those farms for, you know, four or five generations and have right. quite a huge amount of knowledge. But can you imagine 
how the Indigenous person feels sitting in the room who's got, you know, sure. $40,000 totally. years worth of knowledge uh, that's been handed down to them. And so particularly with the Indigenous groups, it's very, and culturally, it's very difficult for them to speak in those kind of public forums. So we actually set up a separate parallel process to conduct special one-on-one -on -one meetings with the Indigenous groups as well to ensure that we were fully capturing, um, you know, their input. And, and did you have a process for taking that one-on-one -on -one, uh, interview uh, to a larger group? Was there a, a, a process for bringing that forward? Um, what we had to do, I, I mean, I guess it, I can't speak for here because I don't have as much knowledge of the Indigenous groups here, but certainly in Australia, um, the best way to, to work with the Indigenous groups is to go through like the hierarchy. So there are um, officially recognised traditional owners um, and groups that you have to approach and go through them. And that, um, if you do that the right way, um, then that helps to, to facilitate getting that interaction to actually happen. But usually, I mean, you have to go out and you have to do it on country, basically. You have to go out and meet them where they are. So, yeah. Yeah, that was also the situation was that India principle that, you know, um, commu Indian community that I, I mentioned where, yeah. you know, um, <laughs> knowing, you know, kind of the, the, the governance, um, Yes. hierarchies and you know um bringing in like the tribal elders and so forth you know is, is really important and um yeah i think you know i i wanted to say also is like um respect to your question barry um you, you know this is like facilitation rules 101 you 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 kind of you kind of set the what the the general rules are principles of engagement are you know right from the get go right and um, and then it's in, in uh, to to get everybody on board before you start and then you need to re go back to the um, will you accept that but you kind of have to have. It's sort of like why I think, you know, philosophy and thinking at a high level before you get into the, you know, um, all the, the books and emotions, et cetera, right? So I'm, I'm going to jump in here. This has been a terrific discussion and I, th I want to thank you all for that. But I, I want to go uh, pivot one more time. And uh, Dr. Malkawi, are you still with us? I am, yes. Oh, excellent. I, um, so, uh, you know, as, as you were talking about your, uh, your, your vision of, of uh, how you implement change and you talked about incentives, one of the things that occurred to me is that oftentimes the incentives that we're talking about are long-term benefits and our stakeholders have a very short horizon. And, uh, uh, you know, I, and then, uh, you know, you bring up the, the Potomac Aqu Aquifer Recharge Project there is obviously one that has uh, very long-term uh, uh, benefits and, and, and in some cases, indirect benefits to the stakeholders. And I'd like to just talk to you about, or have you just discussed briefly, how did you pull that together? How did you get folks to, to buy in on that? Well, so you're definitely correct in terms of a lot of the solutions that we're providing with the SWIFT program are long-term solutions that require kind of that long-range um, mind frame. Uh, but there are some short term issues that we are having in terms of, you know, um, pollution in our waterways, um, the localized flooding, um, you know, uh, stormwater infrastructure needs, um, all of these different today's challenges that we addressed also. So we said, here are today's problems. And here are, you know, the shocks that we have. And here are the stresses that we have in the long term that we need to address as well. So kind of lo looking at the shocks and the stresses and, and providing a solution that does have the near term and long term advantages. So that's kind of how we approached it is, is um, you know, addressing the near and long term solutions. Oops, did you have some stakeholders that were uh, um, that were resistant? 
There certainly were in terms of the funding. You know, there, there, there were a lot of questions in terms of, well, how is this going to be funded? And we really had to show them that, you know, the, the financial model that we have really shows that, you know, we can address all of the priorities within the funding that we currently have. And then um, showing that, you know, the, the region as a whole, the customers that we have, they're paying different rates. So if, if the rates go up in, in one utility and staying the same in the other utility, um, it's still giving the, the, the stakeholder, each stakeholder the same benefit. Uh, some localities said, well, I mean, out, we don't have the infrastructure needs that, you know, the neighboring locality has. So why, why should our customers uh, bear the, the expense of a, a big effort like this if, if the benefits to that specific locality are in the long range? We don't have any localized flooding. We don't have any, you know, in the western part of our service area, that is the case. We, they don't have localized flooding. They don't have uh, a lot of the water issues that we have in the uh, southeastern uh, part of our service area. Uh, but we kind of tried to show it, you know, as a uh, as a state, look at it at the state, look at it at the regional level, it is benefiting overall the sustainability of our uh, community. So there were definitely were some resistors. Um, you know, the one thing that I like to say is, you know, if you want to implement change, and it, it, I, you know, it, it kind of does come back to funding. And if you really want funding, you need the political will. And the best way to get the political will is to get the public will, because that's kind of what, what's going to drive the political will. And one example I, I have on that one is um, the smart sewers concept. And, and a lot of people, when they think of smart sewers, the best example or case study in the US, I believe is South, West, South Bend, Indiana. And if you just simply Google uh, smart sewers, overall, the, one of the first things that you'll probably see is the name Pete Buttigieg. And recently, we all know who Pete Buttigieg is because, you know, as a Democratic uh, presidential nominee, um, however, he was the one as a politician, as the mayor of South Bend, uh, Indiana, he really owned that effort. And even though it was a consent decree, he said, well, we need to be smarter. We need to do something. So he, you know, um, put himself and his face out there in terms of we need to invest in this priority project. Uh, it came from the pu public will. And now the political will was where the rubber met the road in terms of action. Well, that, that's a great answer. And you, and you segue to my next question. And then I'll throw this out to the three of you is that, you know, uh, a lot of the things we're talking about are going to require uh, significant, um, you know, political capital for folks to, uh, to engage in uh, and, and to in, in order to free up the funds to do some of these things. So uh, I'm wondering if, if you all have thoughts on the strategies for, for engaging at the political level. And maybe, um, Barry, would you mind starting on that? And you're muted if you're talking, Barry. OK, well, how about Pierre? I've lost both of them. So, <laughs> honest, would you would you take a first whack at that? How do you how do you engage at the political level? Sure. I, I mean, I, I kind of go back to what I just mentioned: is that the political will really is driven by the public will, and you know, even though the politicians are you know the most influential per se, but they are influenced by the public. So, if you really get the public buy-in. You know, the politicians are kind of got their, um, you know, hands cuffed because they, they really need to please their constituents and the public. So if you really get that public buy-in, uh, the, the political aspect of it, of it becomes uh, rather easy. Looks like Pierre is back. Yeah, sorry, I've got I've got um, somebody um, might come uh, a worker might come here, and so I've got my mask here, <laughs> so uh, it's it's uh, bad timing here. But uh, I I totally agree with what you you said, Anas. Um, I missed a little bit the you know the the few minutes just before you started uh, talking or or before John asked me, and um, 
I, I think, you know, absolutely engaging the, the you know, the public is, is crucial to getting political sustainability, right? You're not going to get political sustainability if you don't engage, you know, the, the community. What you're going to get is, is you know, it's, uh, I mean, we're all, all human. We're, you know, we all want to do good, but we have, you know, we all have kind of short-term motivations. And um, that's just the reality of things. And so in order to kind of get a longer term commitment, it means that we got to engage not just the people who are currently in power, but you know, the, the broader community that basically then can, can provide that, <laughs> that resilience, that political sustainability um, of, of will, right? And so, so I'll totally agree with what Anna said. Okay. Barry, are you back? So we are on time, John. We need. Oh, is it is it time to time to stop? Uh, right, time to wrap up so that we can have a break for fifteen minutes, and then the next panel will start. Okay, very good, very good. Well, I, I you know, I want to thank the panelists. It was. Uh, yeah, it was absolutely really good. a wonderful discussion. So thank right, you all right. very much. Right, and also with audience there. So don't go anywhere. We will take break fifteen minutes, and then we have a presentation during break also. And then we will wrap up this um, uh, talking about, we have a, a good lineup of a speaker, Dick Luthi, as you can see here. He has a ERC Stanford, so we need to hear from him, success story and also the challenges. Then George Hawkins, Hardeep Anand from Miami Dade. So we will talk now about the future, how once we establishing this, how we move path forward and Walter will be moderating. So now I will, let me see here during the break. So Daron, you are there, Austin. Daron, Austin, online. I'm not sure if they're on yet, but they're not presenting until 3.30. Yeah, I'm online, Joe Minus. Oh, perfect. So you are ready to go? Darren, I can uh, introduce yeah. in, introduce you. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, so Darren Austin is, and they are one of our sponsors for this concert, Mueller Water. Darren is director of um, the water management solution for Mueller Water products. And you heard uh, the Mueller uh, talked about in the presentation in the morning session also. So now, Daron, your job is a little bit easier because they learn a lot of things, you know, what Mueller is doing. So Daron currently leads sales and business development effort for the company Ecologist, Singer, and Hydro Guard product line. His 30 years career has focused on sales and marketing of engineering product and services. Daron had a bachelor degree in civil engineering from Bucknell University and is a registered professional engineer in the state of Tennessee. He has a strong work ethics, is responsible and easy to work with. So Darren, floor is yours. You want to share your screen? We lost Darren again. Kathy, do you see Daron? I do not. I'm not sure what happened. Oh, really? We lost him? Maybe a bad internet connection. Oh, okay. Then better we take a quick break, right? Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, I can come back. And Kathy, if Darren is here, then you can get him started. Yeah, I'll keep I that. will just grab coffee. Yeah, I will be back. All right. So 3.30, 3.35? No, he has to start as soon as he comes in. OK, because we're ahead of schedule, aren't we? No, I don't think so. I think we are, but okay. Yeah, no, that we modified 3.30. We need to start the water one.
Darren, did you just join? I did, yes. Hey there. If you want to go ahead and start your presentation, that would be great. Oh, are you running ahead of time? Yes. Yeah, we're good. Oh, okay. Well, good. Well, good. Well, good afternoon. And uh, let me pull up my slide deck and we can get started. So I'm pleasantly surprised. Um, so did you uh, already do an introduction or do you want me to do that myself? You can do a brief one, um, but Dr. Sinha did a brief, uh, short one for you, but you're more than welcome to give us a quick update on yourself. Okay. Well, great. Well, uh, good afternoon, uh, Darren Austin with uh, with Mueller Water Products. I've, I've been with the company for, uh, let's see, seven years. Um, I run what we call a uh, water, our, our water management uh, solutions team. And uh, I'm a licensed professional engineer in the state of, te state of Tennessee. And I've uh, been focused on really marketing and uh, providing solutions uh, for civil engineering products uh, for my career. So without further ado, the uh, presentation today is on assessing pipeline conditions using acoustics. So appreciate the opportunity to present. Um, you know, obviously uh, we're all professionals in the water industry. Um, main breaks cause disruption. They disrupt people traffic, business. They obviously uh, interrupt the news and they also, um, and unfortunately, um, interrupt or disrupt public confidence in our water system. So, uh, and for those of us that are on call um, in the middle of the night, they also uh, interrupt and disrupt our sleep. Um, so the, the challenge is, is that how can we find the weakest link in our water distribution network before they find us. So on this uh, slide is an excerpt from the Fulkerman study, uh, Utah State from uh, 19, uh, excuse me, from 2018. Um, and, you know, we first need to understand what's in our system. And so, um, you know, from this study, um, it's no surprise that cast iron and asbestos cement pipes fail most often. Uh, according to the study, um, that particular cat or those particular categories of pipe have increased by more than uh, 40 percent uh, from 2012 to 2018. So, um, you know, as, as you know, as a result, it's no surprise that these two categories of pipe um, are the target for most replacement projects. Um, and as a matter of fact, 50-year-old um, plus cast iron pipe represents 20% of all the installed pipe um, in the U.S. and Canada or in North America. So the replacement costs range, of course, from one to two million dollars per mile. Um, and uh, however, there's some technology using acoustic uh, acoustics, such as uh, what we call our e-pulse technology that works very well at finding leaks and measuring the remaining wall thickness on these particular pipe types. And um, at a cost of less than $30,000 a mile, it represents only about one to 2% of the total replacement cost. So it's a very economical way to go about assessing the condition of your pipe from outside the pipe. So, um, you know, water utilities uh, are always seeking ways to be smarter with the 15 billion or so that's spent annually in North America to improve water distribution pipeline systems. Um, they want data to help decide which pipes to work on and what types of action to take. Uh, and they wanna do that for the most part without inserting tools or interrupting the water supply. So the last thing a water utility wants to do, right, is replace good pipe. Um, there's a lot of time spent on planning capital projects to replace pipe. A lot of time that's spent designing um, uh, pipe replacement programs. So we wanna use some of that money to um, determine the condition of the pipe um, before we start replacing these projects or these, these pipelines. So 
Um, I'm going to introduce you to a term called ePulse. It's an acoustic based technology um, that helps utilities assess pipeline conditions uh, without inserting any tools into the pipeline. Um, it, remain, it, it basically measures remaining wall thickness. And the tool that we use um, is a correlator. You can kind of see the receiver up there, the transmitter, transmitter one and transmitter two. Um, and the way uh, this, this, this correlator work, which we call Leak Finder ST, um, it's uh, these sensors that are attached are generally smaller than a Coke can and they attach to the outside of the water pipe, either to a hydrant or possibly through excavation directly to the water column uh, if the uh, sensors need to be placed uh, closer than what the hydrants will allow. So generally these sensors are placed about three to 500 feet apart and technicians measure the amount of time it takes for sound to travel between the two sensors. Um, then that velocity, the wave propagation velocity is fed into our proprietary algorithms, you know, al along with other site information like pipe diameter, material, lining condition, in order to remain to determine the remaining wall thickness. So an e-pulse uh, pipeline condition survey um, also includes an acoustic leak detection for each segment of pipe. So what you're ended, you end up having is a, a leak detection survey as well as a remaining wall thickness. So here's how the, the, the process works. A sound is induced either between or adjacent to the two um, sensors uh, that's picked up by the receiver and the speed of sound is recorded uh, in the laptop computer. Uh, this is what it looks like in a little more, a little more closely. Um, the, the kit includes the transmitter, two sensors, um, two hydrophones for use on certain types of pipe, and then magnetic uh, sensors that are attached to the uh, metallic pipes. So in many cases, the um, this correlator, which we call Leak Finder ST, um, is paid for very quickly by the utility just based on the amount of leaks that are found in just a few segments of pipe. So uh, this is kind of what it looks like in the field. Um, what you see here, um, let me make sure everybody can see here. Um, what you see here down in the lower right corner and off into the distance are two ecologics technicians attaching sensors to um, uh, either, uh, in this case, a valve box and a fire hydrant, um, and then inducing a noise. And then it's measuring the, the, the speed in which that acoustic wave travels throughout the pipe. Um, they flow a, a small amount of water, which in, creates a, this test flow creates noise. Um, it's picked up by one sensor first and then the second sensor. And so that from there, the velocity measurement can be, can take place. Um, because the kit is battery operated, portable and attaches to existing fittings outside the water pipe, it's easy to adapt the technology to different types of pipe networks. Um, in some cases, as I mentioned, um, we may need to excavate potholes to actually attach the sensors in between long distances of pipe. So um, this is a technique that's used probably on every third project that we're involved with is, is potholes. So a lot of people ask about um, pitting and corrosion, tuberculation and graphitization. So because, of, uh, because tuberculation and graphitization does not contribute to the structural thickness of the pipe, that's actually ignored in the calculation. Um, pitting and corrosion, on the other hand, will impact the speed in which the sound travels through the pipe. Therefore, it'll impact the e-pulse measured pipe thickness. Um, and again, the, the key here is this is survey level technology. Results from an e-pulse survey are not going to be able to pinpoint 
um, the, the thickness along the length, what's reported is, is really it's a minimum average wall thickness around a length of pipe. So it is a survey level, but it's a very economical survey level assessment from outside the pipe at about $30,000 a mile. So the, um, this minimum average wall thickness over the length of pipe to be tested sometimes is, um, can be a little confusing. So if you found the thinnest remaining wall thickness around the circumference of the pipe and you average this value, that would actually be the E-pulse measurement. And since most metal pipes that are pressurized degrade mostly at the bottom of the pipe, the E-pulse average thickness would be conservative. It doesn't, as I mentioned, it doesn't measure any tubercul tuberculation or graphitization that remains in the pipeline. It's only measuring the remaining structurally intact wall thickness. And the algorithms that we use in the calculation of remaining wall thickness um, has been validated over the past 10 years by many utility partners that we've done business with. Uh, these utility and Clark partners include Suez Water, American Water, WSSC, uh, to name a few. Um, so they've run hundreds of validations on the ePulse technology, uh, comparing these independent thickness measurements with the acoustic ePulse thickness measurements. And our correlation is approximately 91% which is very good agreement between the two data sets. And we continue to refine these algorithms as we get more and more coupons uh, back from utilities who, who wanna double check that our measurements are indeed accurate. One of the uh, additional services that we offer along with the acoustic leak detection survey and average remaining wall thickness survey from ePulse is the remaining service life. Um, so if you think about kind of pipes like brake pads in your car, uh, and we know how much brake pad there was when we started and how much there is now and how long it took to wear down, you can get a pretty good idea of how much longer you can keep driving uh, your car before the brake pads need uh, to be replaced. And it's a similar concept here with remaining service life using acoustics. Um, utility records give us the original installed pipe thickness. Uh, we, we can, uh, and we can calculate how much pipe thickness is needed before the pipe will break. Part of this model, um, and again, these are an, another algorithm that we've built over the past 10 plus years is uh, requires uh, input such as the soil load or the overburden, uh, water pressure and pipe type. So the, the red line kind of shows, um, um, you know, where we can add more value um, to the data set from the utility. In terms of different types of uh, pipe material, um, we work with engineering partners for larger diameter cast iron, AC pipe, steel, PCCP, um, and, and other types of, of, of pipe traditionally used in larger diameter. So we have some engineering partners we work with for remaining service life. But all of these pipe types and diameters are well within the capability of our, the acoustic uh, leak detection technology. I did mention that it's a survey level um, analysis. So by deploying uh, a field crew, um, they can generally do about two miles of acoustic um, leak detection and um, 
average remaining wall thickness work, survey work in about three days without significant interruption or uh, tremendous traffic uh, control issues. Um, and for that, of course, there, the clients will get in return um, a report several weeks later um, that allows them to look at uh, for a particular, for each segment surveyed, the remaining wall thickness, uh, and if there was any leaks found, where those leaks are plus or minus three feet. So it is a survey level report. Um, it would kind of sit in terms of the inverted pyramid from M77, it, it kind of sits just below, say, a desktop model. Um, one of those desktop models um, that is becoming more popular today is kind of what's called a virtual condition assessment. So in the event that the utility um, wants to survey and uh, prioritize their pipes, um, you know, maybe across their entire network, that can be done with um, AI technology or a virtual condition assessment. Uh, we call that pipe rank. Um, so instead of doing a survey level, uh, you know, assessment in the field, this can be done um, with a desktop model. And uh, usually what we do is we gather information from um, three different categories of inputs like utilities, uh, which would include pipe material, age, break history, public data, which would include, you know, weather, soil, seismic activity, et cetera and some other proprietary value, uh, variables. And then um, a, an AI tool analyzes uh, that information and develops a, a prioritization based upon that data. Uh, in a sense, it's um, basically an AI analysis. And then usually the last year of break history is withheld and then compared to the predicted break from the previous year. That's the way that we, we kind of um, can, can demonstrate the accuracy of, of, of pipe rank as a virtual pipeline condition assess, assessment technology. So even though it's beyond acoustics, it's a more economical solution, even if $30,000, uh, you know, $30,000 a mile doesn't fit into a utilities budget. So um, just a little bit more about myself. If you do want some additional information or have, have any questions uh, beyond the conference, uh, feel free to reach out to me with the information you see there on your screen.